The whole world knows the story of the miser named Ebenezer Scrooge, who came home on ghostly Christmas Eve to a series of surprises that began at his own front door. I'm Frank Finlay. A Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens' classic tale, is probably the most popular Christmas story in the world. For many of us, especially in England and America, Dickens is a poet laureate of Christmas. We all of us sometimes feel a bit nostalgic for the Dickens Christmas of roaring fires, hot punch, good fellowship, and God rest ye merry gentlemen. But how many of us are aware of the role that Dickens and his Victorian contemporaries played in inventing the modern Christmas celebration. And how many of us know that the celebration of the holiday was actually illegal in England at one time. This is the story of how Christmas was outlawed, of what happened to the holiday afterwards, and how we got it back. <laughs> Most of us think of caroling as an indispensable part of the Christmas season, the musical centerpiece of the most musical time of the year. But in the middle of the 17th century, the music stopped. This is Oliver Cromwell, the Puritan who stole Christmas. By an act of Parliament in 1652, all celebration of Christmas was made illegal. It was a blow from which the holiday almost failed to recover. Why would anyone, especially a good, God-fearing English Puritan like Oliver Cromwell, want to outlaw Christmas? To answer that question, we have to understand that the modern Christmas celebration is made up of bits and pieces gathered from many places and across the course of many centuries. And we have to go back to the beginning. Long centuries before the birth of Christ, people here in England and on the European continent celebrated a mid-winter festival they called Yule. Yule marked the coming of the winter solstice and the promise for the lengthening of the days of the rebirth of spring. When the early missionaries arrived in Great Britain in the 7th century AD, they took note of the customs surrounding the Yule celebration. Now, many of these customs seem strangely familiar today. The crackling fire of the Yule log, light shining everywhere, greenery brought in to decorate the house, and very special attention paid to an odd-looking, parasitic plant that grew on oak trees, mistletoe. The Yule Festival took place at the same time as Christmas, and the early missionaries, with eminent practicality, decided to transform the traditions of one holiday into those of another, to dedicate the Yule customs to Christmas instead. By the time of the Tudors, especially Henry VIII and his daughter Elizabeth I, the Christmas season was a marathon of dancing, dining, and attending that relatively new pastime, the theatre. And when the Stuart kings took the throne in the person of James I early in the 17th century, a new element was added to the celebration, gambling. By the middle of the century, the English Christmas celebration, at least in the court circles of London, was not a conspicuously religious occasion. Charles I was neither the wisest nor the worst of monarchs, but he was an extravagant man who was determined to enjoy his throne, and he had the misfortune to be sitting upon it when the Puritans became a political force in England. Charles was not brilliant, and he was not a fine general, but the Puritans were led by a man who was both, Oliver Cromwell. By 1649, Cromwell had triumphed, and the monarchy was overthrown. King Charles was deposed, and after bidding farewell to his children, he was beheaded. Cromwell was appointed Lord Protector of the Realm. 
1652, he dropped a bombshell that shook even some of his most ardent supporters. He made Christmas against the law. From his point of view, Cromwell was perfectly right. He knew that many of the customs associated with the celebration were pre-Christian in origin. He was especially upset by the mistletoe, and he loathed the worldly celebrations of the court. Play-going, dancing, drinking, gambling, and even such homely customs as gift-giving and decking the halls with evergreen seemed to him to have little to do with the event that gave rise to the Christian religion. Christmas, he decreed, should be observed soberly, if at all. A thousand years of tradition went out of the window. Caroling was banned, and printers went underground, secretly printing carols like 19th century anarchists cranking out revolutionary pamphlets. Eventually, caroling degenerated into a seasonal begging technique for the London poor. Christmas continued its sad decline even after Cromwell was overthrown. And it was not until the 19th century that eventually the ancient customs began to be revived in England. As is so often the case, the British public took its lead, at least in part, from the royal family. England had a new queen, Victoria. And Victoria was madly in love with her consort, the dashing Prince Albert. The royal couple had beautiful children. They were, first and foremost, a tight-knit and very happy family. And Albert loved Christmas. The holiday may have been in eclipse in England, but Albert was German from the Duchy of Saxe-Coburg, and he brought part of his holiday celebration with him. It was a small fir tree hung with ornaments and toys. This picture of the royal family, first published in 1848, helped to create a craze in England for the new fashion called the Christmas tree. celebrations were followed by the British public as breathlessly as readers of today's English tabloids follow the royal romances. And one member of that public, the man who worked in this room, was to make an enduring contribution to the literature of Christmas, the novelist Charles Dickens. Dickens was the most popular writer of the day and a great Christmas enthusiast. Like so many Victorians, he was rather sentimental in the best sense of the word. He upheld the ideals of home and family. And of all the world's great writers, he was probably the one who cared the most and wrote the most about children. The upper-class Victorians were a contradictory lot. They loved their own sons and daughters, but they turned their backs on children who slaved 12 to 14 hours a day in the coal mines. They wept over Dickens' David Copperfield finding his way up from poverty, but most of them firmly believed that it was God's will that some people should be hungry while some had more than they needed. To Charles Dickens, who had been a poor child himself, and felt a very special sympathy for the children of the poor. This was an outrage. And he saw in the new popularity of the holiday season a chance to make his point that any real celebration of Christmas had to include charity towards those who were less well off. Now this is the first of five Christmas books written by Dickens between 1843 and 1848. It is, of course, a Christmas carol. Ebenezer Scrooge represents many of the, of the qualities Dickens most deplored in his contemporaries. He is grasping and unfeeling, with no sense of responsibility to anyone but himself. Clear the road, out of the way, let me through. Everything that threatens his supreme selfishness is dismissed with a single word. <laughs> Humbug. Dickens put his own feelings about Christmas 
into the mouth of Scrooge's poor but good-hearted nephew, Fred. There are a great many things from which I might have derived good, from which I have not profited, I dare say. Christmas among the rest. But I've always thought of Christmas time when it comes round as a good time, a kindly, forgiving, charitable time. A time when men and women seem by one consent to open their shut-up hearts freely to their fellow creatures. And so Uncle Verity has never put a scrap of gold or silver into my pocket. I do believe that it has done me good. And I say, God bless it. Not a sound from you. And you'll keep your Christmas by losing your situation. Of course, as the whole world knows, Bob Tatchett doesn't lose his station. Instead, Scrooge is dropped in on by three ghosts who show him the error of his ways and transform him into a man who, in Dickens' words, knew how to keep Christmas well. The book stressed everything about the holiday that the Victorians held dear. Emphasis on sentiment, on the family, especially on the Cratchit family, and on children. The Victorians were the first to direct Christmas towards children, and they took Tiny Tim directly to their hearts. And God bless us, everyone. A Christmas Carol was published just before the Christmas season of 1843, and it was an enormous success. In their enthusiasm for the newly rediscovered holiday, the Victorians bought out three editions of the book by the new year, making it one of Dickens' most immediately popular works. The great novelist Thackeray said of it, it seems to me to be a national benefit, and to every man and woman who reads it, a personal kindness. And the Christmas celebrations continue to take shape. The first commercially printed Christmas card appeared in London at the same month that Dickens published A Christmas Carol. That modestly tinted pretty little card was only a beginning. As Christmas was celebrated more widely and printing techniques improved, the Christmas card evolved into an art form all of its own. Today, of course, billions of cards, both simple and ornate, are sent every year, helping to sustain an industry that essentially came into being in Dickens' day. By the end of the 19th century, almost all the major elements of the modern Christmas had come together. But something was missing. And this final bit of decoration for the holiday came to England by the longest and strangest route of all, from Turkey to Holland to America and only then to England. St. Nicholas of Cusa was a 4th century Turkish bishop, renowned for his generosity. In one famous legend, he saved three destitute girls by throwing bags of gold into their house in order to provide them with dowries so that they could marry. In one version of the legend, the bags of gold landed in the young women's stockings which they had hung up to dry. St. Nicholas was also a patron saint of sailors, believed to be able to fly to the side of a ship in distress and see it safely home to land. By the middle of the 16th century, St. Nicholas was now firmly entrenched in Holland as a bearer of gifts. The ship that brought the first Dutch settlers to America had a wooden figurehead of St. Nicholas on its prow. But the Dutch couldn't keep St. Nicholas a secret in their new land. By the 18th century, their non-Dutch neighbours had adopted Sinterklaas, as he was called colloquially, and transformed him into the easier to pronounce Santa Claus. In 1822, an American college professor named Clement Moore wrote a poem for his children, which he entitled, A Visit from St. Nicholas. It began with the famous lines. "'Twas the night before Christmas, and all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. Now, all that was needed was an image. The Dutch had envisioned St. Nicholas as a bishop, but that was a bit too sober for the subject of Dr. Moore's poem. Enter an artist named Thomas Nast, famous as one of the founders of the American political cartoon. Nast visualized a rotund, bearded, merry old elf forever climbing in and out of chimneys. The image endured. 
and today's version of Santa Claus is easily recognized as a modern incarnation of Thomas Nast Santa of 160 years ago. In this century, he found his way to England as the contribution of America and Holland to the Christmas celebration. There you have it, the rediscovery of Christmas. It took several hundred years and involved millions of people. And hundreds of millions of people, people on all the world's continents and belonging to all the world's races, celebrate it today. They celebrate a season of good fellowship and generosity of spirit, of love for one's family, and charity to the less well-off. And in that spirit, I'm sure that most of you, if not all of you, will join with me in a sentiment that was yet another Victorian Christmas gift from the pen of Charles Dickens. As Tiny Tim says, God bless us, everyone. This film was made possible by IBM.